Paratrooper squads have always been a source of enjoyment for me in the Company of Heroes franchise. Airborne from the skies, paratroopers can catch your opponent off guard the moment they are brought onto the battlefield, and they pack a punch right away with their readily available grenades, satchels, and weapon upgrade options. This game analysis showcases a build order to incorporate paratroopers with an M191 LMG upgrade into your games, and I explain the key decisions that I make throughout it. Paratroopers in Co3 have less of an elite infantry status compared to previous games in the Co franchise, with players typically saying, what's the point, and preferring to simply go for more riflemen squads instead. This game shows you that paratroopers still do have a place in the US Forces Army composition, but with a different role compared to the conventional riflemen. So with that said, let's make our jump and get onto the battlefield to follow the journey of a paratrooper squad. When I plan to use paratrooper squads against Wehrmacht, how I like to start the game off is getting out a Pathfinder squad, converting them, and I pick the airborne battle group right off the bat. I convert my scouts to Pathfinders, send one of the Pathfinders to cap the south part of the map, and the other Pathfinders, which I'm building at my base, I send them to the north of the map. When I'm getting Pathfinders or scouts or multiple scouts or Pathfinders at the start of the game, I like to send them to different directions of the map just to maximize my capping speed of the map in the early game. Because Pathfinders and Scouts, they have one of the fastest capping rates in the game, so I want to maximize that. And what I want to do is I want to secure as much map of control that I can in the early game to get good vision so I can figure out where it is that I can best deploy my paratroopers onto the map. Because that is one of the advantages of, of paratroopers. You can deploy them wherever you want. And I'll go through that decision making process in about five minutes time once I get access to my first um, 1CP to deploy that paratrooper squad. I am also making three riflemen. So I've got one out on the field. He'll be controlling the center and the other one will be aiding him as he goes onto the map. When I'm Doing a build like this, I find it works best against Wehrmacht. It's a bit more difficult to make it work against Stack just due to the fact that the Flak half track comes out, and even the 8 rad to an extent, can come out and really punish Pathfinder and Paratrooper base play. I do find this build order works best against Wehrmacht, so please keep that in mind as you watch this. So... I'm starting to cap up the map. I'm controlling the territory. I'm maximizing the amount of ammunition now that I cap on the map. So I've got my fuel. I've got the fuel down south. I just want to get as much ammo as I can. Firstly, so I can start to get a utility package and start to shoot some rifle grenades if possible. But also so that when my paratroopers hit on, arrive on the map, I can upgrade them with an LMG or Bazooka squad as soon as I can. You'll see in this game, though, I do get LMG squads, and there's a reason behind it. My opponent this game, and I might pause it here, Samovar is a top 30 player. I'm a top 30 player as well with US. And once he recognizes at this point in time, he's seen my Pathfinders. He's already thinking what the counter is that he'll be putting in place. A very common counter to Pathfinder based play at high level is to simply go for MP40 Grands and combine that with a 221 Scout Car. And we'll see he does this to counter my strategy. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to show this replay is because my opponent has recognized what I've done and they have gone for the most optimal strategy to counter the foundation that I'm laying to incorporate paratroopers into my army. So I'll continue on with the game. So I've recognized it's got a grand there. It's caught out of position a little bit, so I start to put pressure on it. I do recognize that he ha was capping up the north with his Kedencrad, but all of a sudden he reveals this additional pyro squad and a grenadier, and I'm like, no, 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 I can't win this engagement. I better smoke this to try swing it a bit in my favor shooter for rifle grenade he does a fantastic job of dodging it and i know that's the end of that engagement for me it's best to simply run on back to base and wait until i get that additional rifle out to help defend my cutoff which he may move towards i have to bring this rifle across to help defend that territory and 
This squad is pretty hurt, but I've got enough manpower to afford a medics station, so I place that as the priority so that I can bring these units back onto the field as healthy as possible. So you can see here, I'm starting to push forward thinking, yeah, I can get in close here and win this engagement. But all of a sudden, the tables turn because what does my opponent do? He gets out the MP40 Grands, which is the direct counter to what the strategy is that I'm going for. So he starts to apply pressure. He's trying to zone me out of the map. And he's sending this Kedenkrad up and across to my cutoff. You can hear it moving up here. This Pathfinder is doing a good job. It is capping that side of the map. But I'm about to be cut off. Which is not good. I'm going to lose all the man, or the, the fuel and ammo income that I've got from this half of the map. So, what do I do here? I need to keep on trying to fight him back. His Grenza are hurt. I need to keep that in mind. His Grenza are hurt. They will eventually have to retreat. I've got the defender's advantage of being close to my base and close to healing. So I'm just playing the patience game here. He overcommits here. I know I can focus down that squad and that will be forced to retreat. And I did pop a, a, a rifle grenade in there as well. He was a bit distracted at that point in time and it's forced a really nice retreat. Um, so I know that this is good. This is what a, the opportunity I'm looking for. He is retreating. He's got three guns retreating into his base. And if you were mindful there, he just upgraded to Vet 1. So he got the upgrade from the T1 tech structure. I always forget what it's called. Uh, but it allows all T1 units to have Vet 1, which means he'll have medic kit access. And his scout car will be delayed. So that's some good information that I am aware of. But he does have a fourth Gren. So I'm counting his Gren squads. So I managed to push him off that fuel with that... Um, hurt riflemen and at this point I've just selected my paratroopers and I know exactly where I'm going to send it the reason why I know exactly where I'm going to send it is because this scout is about to cut him off from the north here and because I've got nothing that can push this cat and crowd away so I want to disconnect this so that he doesn't have a big um, fuel or ammo income so this naturally is going to become the next drop zone once I deal with this Grenadier threat. And you can see the power of the MP40 Grands in the early game. They can, if you don't catch them out in a no-cover position, they do have the power to just push your riflemen or scouts out of position. So I'm calling it in here. And the benefit of doing this as well is it's going to force those Grenz in his base to move to the south rather than to the north to push away my pathfinder so it, it is beneficial that i am doing this drop in here and your first drop with your paratroopers is very important you want to put it in a position where you are getting time efficiency out of it but not in a position where it's got overextended and it's going to just be forced to instantly retreat without a purpose the purpose here that i've got is to cut him off and keep myself in contention for the fuel war and force his army to move into the south, which it, I've done appropriately. It's forced his whole army back down here. So that buys me a bit of time. It buys me time because he's cut off. I'm cut off. <laughs> We're both not getting any resources in. But that's okay for me. Because at least I'm slowing down his fuel income and delaying the scout car arrival. I'm starting to count... Upgrade my infantry support center. So we'll have the captain out in a moment. And there's finally a bit of a lull in the combat. But this means during this time, he will start placing sandbags and capping and finding out the next position that he's going to be attacking from. And I've lost vision control of him now. So I just have to start making some educated or guesses. Where is it that he's going to be coming next? But we can see that scout car has made its way onto the field. So once I recognize this, I'm not panicking though. I know that the scout car can be countered with what I've got. I'm not packing, pa panicking getting out grenades by any means. But simply put, I'm waiting for the LMG upgrade. I'm not going to get bazookas. The LMG upgrade can counter the scout car respectfully. And especially once I get the captain mount, they can both double team that. I might even show you... 
how that will work out. Now, I've fallen back to my green cover point there a little bit. You can see I'm putting pressure on that cannon crowd as well. And I'm just saving my ammo. Once I get this ammunition, I want to get that LMG upgrade for the M191 A6s as soon as I can. I'll go back a little bit, just heal up. And that's something that I do want to bring to your attention as well. It's very important to keep on healing your paratroopers. They are a bit more expensive to reinforce in comparison to riflemen. They cost 30 reinforcement costs, whereas rifle are 26. So it does add up. You don't want to be losing models unnecessarily. But you can see here the LMG is doing a lot of damage to that scout car. And it goes the same for the paratroopers. I am upgrading them. So I'm getting them to a position where they're going to be able to take on some combat. Commander, we've lost a sector. So now, just capping up the map. He's sprinting in. He wants to get me away from that arrow, but a quick garrison can circumvent that. And what I've done here is I've sprinted to this green cover and I've got my paratroopers moving into that zone. The reason why I'm sprinting there is I want to get there as fast as possible because my paratroopers have just been upgraded with this LMG. Now, a very important point to be aware of with this LMG is it cannot fire on the move. You can see it in the description, and they're most effective at long range. I'm up against MP40 Grens, which they've got the ability to sprint, and they want to get in close. So it becomes a bit of a cat and mouse game now. I want to maintain long range, and he wants to get in close to my paratroopers. And you'll see throughout this game, I'm constantly now using my paratroopers in a defensive way where I'm setting them up in green cover and anticipating where I'm where my opponent is going to be sending his grenadiers. So let's see how that goes. You can see the burst from at long range is pretty substantial. It forces them to turn around the corner and take some fire from the pour it on him rifles in that position. He realizes once I retake the garrison that it's not safe for him. He has to go back and heal. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring these two LMG squads together to counter that scout car into the south. But he does need a bit of repairs. He's moved off to the right. So the next best option is for me to harass these grenadiers which are trying to deny my pathfinders from capping. There are grenadiers moving into the center and you can see there he has a Jaeger as well. So he's stepping back, going back to his green cover positions, which he was able to build. And it's a, a point in time where I just want to slowly recap the map. And my M8 is coming out, which is good. That's going to give me that mobile counter to deal with that scout car. And here I, I rotate because I know this, the Grens... I'm not going to be able to do much damage to him, but if I can do a little bit of extra damage onto this scout car, I might be able to catch him out of position once the grey account hits the field. My paratroopers have done enough work there. I start to send them back before this big blob can get into their retreat path. And the scout car is going to be met by the M8 Greyhound. I want to rush it in there just in case I can get a little flank off or surprise attack on it. He does see me first with the Grens though. So I know naturally I can't probably push as deep as I'd like here because he did have that Shrek Jaeger in that position there. So I decide to just take it easy and back out a little bit. During this time, his Kettenkrad has started capping the top section of the map again. So he does have a, a increased fuel income comparison to me. And we can see that there. He's on 33. I'm on 40. Oh, 13, sorry. And what I've done now, back to my paratroopers. Whenever they're back in their base, I'll try to give you a sense of what's going on with the game. Uh, but whilst they were in my base, I did select my VET-1 upgrade. The VET-1 upgrade that I have selected is Concealment. This is a really powerful VET-1 upgrade if you use it correctly. What it does, Concealment, is when your squad is camouflaged by being placed in cover and not in combat, they get this little passive bonus that gets procked off whenever you start to enter combat. 
It gives them 25 damage and 40% accuracy when firing from camouflage for the first five seconds or when they get revealed from their camouflage. So you can do some really nice ambushes with this. It can be very powerful. You can also combine it with the hold fire functionality to wait for your opponent to get nice and close and then set off an ambush on them. You can e even time that in with one of the grenades. So I'll keep on playing this. And what this is actually, I might even play this in slow motion. What I want you to appreciate here is they've gone cloaked. So that means when you see this symbol, it means you can make this concealment upgrade be active in the next engagement but you can also leapfrog it a little bit so these paratroopers get access to the yellow cover here and as they continue to work forward you can see that they're moving forward but they still have access to that vet one ability so as they come out of that cloak there even though they were moving they still are able to get that bonus off onto the units that they can see. So you do have one or two steps that you can get a bit of benefit from that. But once the um, proc has worn off, which was indicated by that lightning bolt, I just back on up. The M8s continue to, to harass the top. I've secured the cutoff there, which is good. So I know that I can start to send this Pathfinder back across here to cap up the top side of the map. Everything else is kind of consolidating in the center here because my next target that I want to hit is that cutoff. You can see I'm really harassing his cutoffs. I'm not playing the slow game because I know my Pathfinders can simply back cap the map. I can send that Pathfinder there or this one back here to cap those points. My main army, I want to try hit his cutoffs where possible. So what I'm doing here, I'm jumping into this green cover, just running from cover to cover. I'm using my path pa paratroopers defensively. If they're not in cover or at long range, it's not a favorable engagement for me. But that storm has got something else to say about it. So my opponent has also got the Stoss Troop and he used that call-in ability, Mechanized Assault Group. I know it's not from a T4 tech structure or tier three so that that engagement there highlighted what the counters are at the moment his uh his half track was taking shots at my paratroopers and my m8 was targeting his stoss trooper our light vehicles are the key to tackle our elite infantry and vice versa So you can see here, I have been forced to do a big retreat. Everything's healing up. So he's taking this opportunity to cap up the map. I'm taking the opportunity to place some mines in areas where he can't. And at this point, I'm also starting to incorporate some more anti-infantry into my army as well. Because I know likely where he's going to be moving towards is either a verbal vent or a Panzer IV, and both of those options do require a bit of fuel income for him. So I've got, I know I've got the time to get the bar upgrade and even get this mortar out. This mortar is a good choice here because I don't have the fuel to get a tank depot. I don't really feel like the anti-tank gun is going to be the best of use either. And if I really need a panic call in an anti-tank gun, I can just drop it in with that and have the M8 stall as long as I can. So the mortar is a good choice here. It basically will allow me to dislodge this building and any other positions that he might be having. Now, what my next role for this paratrooper is, because cover's starting to be a little bit destroyed in some sections, and this center of the map has some really nice, reliable green cover in the form of these indestructible brown rocks, and here yeah, these walls are pretty strong. I want to be hanging around here and moving these from green cover to green cover. You could see the penetration damage from the LMG there was almost enough to kill that Kettenkrad. But this Stummel continues to chip away at my paras. He knows that this is a good position to place them in. I'm continuing to harass the south with my riflemen as well as cap in the north. 
Ideally, this would be my Pathfinders capping these points, but as it stands, I've sent them to the wrong area. But we'll keep on, keep on following the paratroopers since they are the focus unit of this game. So there's another good scenario of I don't want to overextend them. Whilst there is a break in the combat, let's make a quick comparison between paratroopers and riflemen. Paratroopers have more durability than riflemen with an extra 10 HP per model, which means they can survive an extra rifle shot. When there is no upgrades, paratroopers' carbines are best at long range, and this is further accentuated with upgrades. However, paratroopers do have a threat up their sleeve at short range, and that's their cooked frag grenade. Paratroopers have a fuse time of 0.7 seconds, which is significantly less than a rifleman grenade's 1.1 seconds. This makes it much harder to dodge. 15 minutes and we've been pretty doing a pretty good job of protecting our manpower you can see he's probably got the manpower lead he's killed an extra eight models compared to me team on the field. and he's also probably got the f resource lead as well he's had the majority of the map for a little bit longer than me but by all means it's still an even game we're both in it my mortar was just there before I had a feeling it'd start to take some shots, so I just moved it preemptively, which was a good decision. And my path paratroopers are back onto the map. They're starting to harass this scout car and pushing it across where I know I want to remove that threat as fast as possible since the M8 is having to defend the north and protect the anti-tank gun. Some good mines go off there to delay the Jaeger and to shut down that stumble from pushing any further. What I'm doing here with my paratroopers is I want to get them into this house. Whenever you can get your LMG paratroopers into a garrison, they become very strong. So obviously they're, they excel at long range, but they're able to target units from that long range using the LMG. And it's hard to flush them out of those buildings because they can any infantry that tries to approach it and throw a grenade can cop a lot of damage on the approach the sauce trooper were already close by there so that was a well-used grenade and a, essentially a force grenade as well because if he didn't chuck that they would have been in a losing position but both stoss and paratroopers recognize that yep we need to heal i need to heal and they come to a mutual agreement to to fight another day <laughs> Now, this was a good thing that I observed. I noticed here he has a second Stoss Troopin. It's pretty unlikely he'd call in a second half track. So I know he's got his T4 tech structure up. I'm starting to think, all right, I probably need to get out some more AT here. I could have built the tank depot, but I decided to get out the Shafi. I wanted a bit of mobility. And I wasn't confident that if I built the tank depot... I would have had enough fuel to be able to get out a Sherman in time. Considering I did have a halt here, I probably could have taken that option, but I I uh, eared on the side of caution just in case. And it still works out well. Because if you look at my army composition, it works out well because I've got a lot of vision control. I've just got I've got two Pathfinders still on the field. So they can provide vision through their base high vision or the flares. I've just popped the recon run. And the reason why I've popped this recon run is to figure out, does he have the tank yet? And what does it reveal? It reveals that he is does not have a tank on the field, but he is building one. I could see this animation on the T4 building. So I knew that there's going to be a Panzer IV or a Brumba. And he is building a Brumba. You can see that on the replay. It is going to be coming my way in just a moment. So I start to recognize here that I need to keep my AT together. I need to keep my Shafi, my anti-tank gun, all in positions where I have good vision control. The paratroopers are pushing into the south here. They know that, all right, there's the Stoss troop in here, but there is also a Stoss troop in squad here. So they need to preemptively not jump on that side of the cover, but get in a green cover position where they can anticipate this motion and start Start focusing him down. You can see how much that burst of damage did to him as they're out of cover. They're tearing down those Stoss Troopin as they're running past. And that gives them nice veterancy. The Brumbar is coming around to put on some pressure here. And I've got it off a massive shot. Now, 
here I make a bit of a, a tactical blunder. What you can see here is I'm making the decision to move my paratroopers forward. The reason why I made this decision was because I realized his Brumba was a little bit overextended and I wanted to try get those Jaegers focus fight down with my paratroopers. But then I saw the Grenadiers a little bit further behind that and I recognized at that point I had made the wrong decision. Because if I push deeper with my Shafi, I just get fausted. I need a backup here. And what would have been better with these paratroopers would be to simply keep him in that green cover and then keep on firing down on the Stoss Trooper, which are moving forward to try to dislodge the anti-tank gun, which had armor-piercing rounds engaged and was the reason why this Brumba took a lot of damage. So he recognizes that. He starts to push forward. I start to panic that, all right, this wasn't the right decision. I got to get back and just start retreating. The engineers turn off their might sweepers to do as much damage as possible to that Stoss Troopin as it pushes up. And the M8 comes around to the rear as well. Instantly engage the Vet 1 Fieldscraft to improve the repair rate and then start to get these guys repaired. Now, one thing that I do here with my M8, which was a really good decision, was that I knew that you can see even the shift click. I've shift clicked the engineer onto that um, Shafi and then that M8. I prioritized the Shafi first. The reason why I did that was because this M8 is now going across the map to counter this Kedenkrad. I know all of his AT potential is in the south of the map. And I might even just show that with the all players view. I knew that everything was in the south. That Brumba's there. That Jaeger's there with the Shrek. So I am safe to just not fully repair my M8 here. And just bring it across in order to counter this Cat and Crud. Which is very quickly capping the north. That is its primary role. Now, I'll switch back to just my vision, just so it gives you a sense of the decisions that I'm making based on the information that I get. And I recognize here that I could come in for a little sneaky attack here. He still hasn't had time to heal up his Rumba, and I can work my way across, get in one little shot, and that's enough to force a player to recognize that, yep, I'm overstepping the boundaries, I should go on back. Now he's starting to push the middle. It's going to force a retreat on a lot of these squads. Pathfinders do go down, so that's my second squad loss because I did lose my other Pathfinders in that big engagement over there. But the paratroopers are coming back with a vengeance. They've got the concealment bonus upgraded. They're charging up, trying to get some green cover so that they can stand still and focus them down. But the, <laughs> the M8 says, nah, we're going to destroy that green cover. <laughs> And now I'm starting to settle down there. But I, I'm a bit hesitant to push a bit forward, more forward here. Because if I listen to the fog wall, I know the Brumba's there. I don't have too much infantry to guide the way. Um, so I, I start to just just pause a little bit with the anti-tanker. Because I don't want to get caught out. But recognizing that it is still there. It hasn't fully repaired yet. Um, so I do have to retreat that squad, but it's giving me the information that I need. And everything is back in base, just repairing up. Now, I decide here, I do have the tank bit depot on the way, so it is built. So my next unit is going to be a tank of some short sort. I like to go Shermans in this position when my opponent has got two Stoss Troopin. I think it's a good call, so that's what I'm saving up for. The paratroopers jumped in that building, got some nice vision, but I know that that Brumba, I heard it coming up, so I want to keep it, just move back and just not take unnecessary damage. So I just cloak into this position so that I know eventually he's going to come forward like that, whether it was through this avenue here or to cap this VP, so I can get off some free damage there, and you can see it's starting to nuke him down a bit. So that's about a quarter of the Stoss Troopin's health burst down, in the space of four seconds, which is huge. It's a lot of damage very quickly. You want to maximize the usage of that ability. The Stummel's starting to say no to the Paras though again. The Arch Nemesis. And I start to back out. 
I brought the Shafi in there because I was like, he's only got one granny. If he fouls me, he fouls me. No biggie. But the Brumba is now fully healed and it's starting to... I've done a really good job this game. I Yeah, it's only got one kill. I've constantly kept moving and avoiding shots and retreating as necessary. So it is doing a lot of health damage, but it's not really draining my manpower. But that was a big shot. <laughs> I probably spoke a bit too soon. M.A. Terras in the side. And he wants to push my Brumba here. I recognize this, that he's... That aggression there that he was showing, he wants to try push my Brumba. I instantly called in the second anti-tank gun. Because I don't have the fuel to call in my tank yet. I could have maybe gone for a, a Hellcat tank destroyer. That may have been an option. But I wanted the anti-infantry still. So I wanted the Sherman. So I had the manpower. I dropped in the anti-tank gun to help me out there. Paratroopers are still continuing to do the work. And you can see there, they offered a really strong kill assist there. The paratroopers did a lot of damage whilst the grands were capping that point. And I might show that in a picture-in-picture picture replay in the corner. And the M8 just simply scrounged up the, the, the kills on the retreat, which is super handy. Knowing that I've killed now a couple of his grands, he's only got a couple left... I know that the support that he's offering his units is starting to dwindle. And the mortar can start to get up the scraps from the fact that he doesn't have too much pushing power, especially when he has to repair. The recon run is giving me a huge amount of information, which gives me the confidence to push in here, whilst the paratroopers are continuing to cap the center of the map. I'll go to the tech map for a bit so you can get a sense of where everything is positioned. I know this, the north is relatively is free of anything so i'm just pushing everything into the middle here i'm bringing up those two anti-tank guns together so that they can constantly focus down a single vehicle and maybe get a quick burst of damage off and get a wipe but now that the recon run has subsided i know i just need to start forming a defensive position in the green cover in anticipation for where he's going to push next so i start to form an a line of fire where these anti-tank guns can somewhat protect each other. If I needed to, I can just drive over that wall. The paratroopers are in their commanding position, just constantly using green cover, getting that cloak up, and then using the concealment damage to do some nice hard-hitting hits as the Axis infantry approach them. Stumbles wanting to flush him out again. The Brumba goes in for a decisive push on that anti-tank gun, but it has overstepped its boundaries. I engage armor-piercing rounds and start to flooding my Shafi and Sherman. Whilst this is occurring, the paratroopers stand still, and they start to focus down these Stoss Troopen. Eventually have to retreat, but the damage has been dealt. This was a really decisive engagement there, which was good. And it happens because the concealment that the paratroopers provided on the front line to provide that extra little bit of vision as the Brumba did come on the approach. So I'm continuing to place down some mines. Understanding where he's going to be moving next and continuing to provide this recon. This recon runs these... I've lost my pathfinders now, but their flares, they allow me to make some really informed, good decisions, which allows me to move my anti-tank guns and my paratroopers into commanding positions where I know that they're going to be able to get in in a safe spot, but also a position where they might be able to inflict a high amount of damage. My captain has marked vehicle. I think I used marked vehicle on that scout car to try do a bit of damage. The Shermans and the Riflemen are flushing everything out. And now I'm really starting to command my position. We're I'm starting to get that population advantage. I'm locking down the map. And I know from all the vision control, I know where he's sending his units. You can see he's got two Grens in the north. So I know, all right, that's nothing that a single M8 and a Rifleman can't handle. So they start to push on up to push them back and then recap the map accordingly. The paratroopers are just exiting the base now as well, so they'll, they'll be moving their way into the center. 
So we'll have a look at this tank engagement that's occurring in the south. He does call out the command panzer as well, which shot that smoke forward there. But the M8 is after blood there. I probably, in this engagement, should have kept my rifleman probably around here. And just let the M8 do its work so that I could keep that M that rifleman there to then recap this map. Because now I have to send a, one of these other squads up there to recap it. So that was probably something I could improve in the future. But the paratroopers, they go straight for this cutoff. Cut off the ammo supply as fast as I can. Whilst also using this green cover to advantage. Enemy movement near victory point. So whilst the paratroopers are just capping in the north, let's have a look at the engagement in the middle and south. Which comes to an end. Acknowledged. Carpet bombing. A victory point I did start to select it. my um, battle group options as well. I unlocked the carpet bombing running. But I made the decision that I just want to keep on spamming recon runs. The recon runs have really been allowing me this game to make good decisions and move around the map accordingly. One thing that I forgot to bring attention to, I I upgraded this as well, probably about 5 to 10 minutes ago. And this gives all infantry an extra 10 HP, which is huge. If you consider paratroopers, they do start with a hundred and eleven HP. Oh, I said that wrong. One hundred and ten HP, <laughs> and it starts to bulk them out. They can take a lot more punishment in an engagement. When we compare that to a rifleman, so a vet one or vet zero to vet two rifleman, they've got a hundred HP, but then that brings them up to one hundred and ten with that upgrade. And even more so, when you get your paratroopers to vet 3, they get an extra 15 HP So for each model. So this squad can come to 135 HP for every single model, which is substantial. So pushing in here, I've got vision control. I know I'm safe to do this. Keep on pressing that advantage. Start to pop in some airburst barrages. The recon run is still providing some really nice vision. Paratroopers have finished capping that, so they'll move up on forward in a moment. And the flare, or the white phosphorus, brings the engagement to a end. But now, I know everything that he has is in the south. Everything is in the south. So this captain's going to finish... Capping this, that recon runs confirm that as it passed through the base. Excuse me. And what I'm doing now is I'm bringing everything to the middle. You can see it I'm in the south. I'm starting to form that defensive line. I'm starting to also put my paratroopers behind my shafi. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is when Axis players see a shafi by itself like this, they may be inclined to simply move forward with it against it with their infantry because a Shafi doesn't really do that much anti-infantry. Now, if they do make that decision to approach, the paratroopers will then come out of their concealment and do a nice big burst of damage. So you can set up some ambushes by moving behind your Shafi and using that green cover to form the cloak. So what I'm doing here, I'm continuing to airburst barrage. I did hear that his Kedenkrad was around this location as well. So once the airburst barrage is finished, I start to smoke this area too. And that's, you could just hear it there. I start to smoke it to shut down his ability to see the map. So I might even just switch to my opponent's point of view. You can see here... He's using the vision control. I'm just outside of his vision. He, all he can see there is the Shafi. But now once I activate that smoke, it completely shuts him down. He has to move forward awkwardly. He doesn't know, all right, is this a good avenue for attack? He's not sure. He starts to question himself, and I think he it even caused that. I, I think that might have been a misclick on the two Grands, or the two Stoss, but it's made him doubt himself if it's safe to push. Now he does have vision have control. And... 
He thinks, all right, there's no paratroopers here. The infantry is all pushing back. But he's still moving his tanks. But the smoke keeps on coming down. I'm playing the vision game. And I've got the three VP points in my favor here. So I know he has to push me. I don't have to push him. So I'm just forming that defensive line. You can see it there. <laughs> it's all just forming a nice cohesive line waiting for him to come to me. And he does come to me. The paratroopers recognize that. And I want to start focus down these Stoss Troopen, which are pushing towards me. Let's see how much damage I do that quickly against them. They just get nuked. Paratroopers coming out of that concealment are huge. I throw some grenades to try to anticipate where he's going to be, but I do miss. I continue to stay still, focus down that squad. Once it gets out of retreat range, I start to focus down that squad. Once I killed that, I start to focus down the other squad. And you can see I'm starting to rack up the kills and the kill assists using this paratrooper. Whilst that was occurring, there was a push occurring in the south with the scout car. My M8 did go down, the hero M8. But it was worthwhile for that push. Now, I've at this point, I can see there's 25 VPs. I know this is now a winning position. But I want to get these paratroopers, which have been fantastic all game. 14 kills, a lot of kill assists. I want to get them to vet 3, so what do I do? I chuck out the satchel just to give the icing on the, on the cake and watch these guys go from 120 HP to 135 HP models. We've got a total of 810 health, it's huge. They're so tanky at that point. And the game is won. You can see, just the post-game mount. My army population was starting to get big there. I would have just started, if this game was going longer, I would have got one more tank out and then just started to slap on these abilities as well. Probably not logistics since it's so late, but definitely demos and potentially this as well if I had to, but mainly demos. So hopefully from watching this game, you did learn a thing or two. I'll also show the stats if for those that are curious. And let's definitely check out the efficiency of the paratroopers. You can see there, 14 kills and 2.5k damage. Which is substantial when you compare that to the three riflemen that I have on the field. And not to mention that the riflemen were more close range, So they do a lot more damage a lot more quickly. So the, the paratroopers were fantastic. As well as the M8 capitalizing on the long range damage that the paratroopers provide. I'll show my opponent's stats. And that's it. Thanks for watching. Hope you learned something. Take care, and I'll see you next time. Bye.